It is with the greatest honor and humility that I would like to introduce you all to His Excellency President Tong. He needs no introduction to many of you. Indeed, as I've uncovered walking around New Haven with him for a day and a half, uh, that he doesn't need to go far to be recognized by people randomly um, and to even have them ask to take a selfie with him. Um, <laughs> As you know, he is the former president of Kiribati, <clears throat> but truly he's become known for his being at the forefront of raising global awareness about the existential threats caused by climate change. He's been described as the world's climate warrior, although I can say I find him to be a little more of a Zen warrior. He's, of course, won many awards and, and, uh, and recognition for his climate work, including the Hillary Laureate, the Peter Benchley Ocean Award for his work in creating the largest maritime uh, protected um, zone of the Phoenix Islands, which has since been recognized as a UN World Heritage Site. Um, he's won a TED Prize. Uh, he's won numerous honorary degrees and, of course, that Nobel Peace Prize nomination. Um, but these are facts that you might know about him. I wanted to share that the most important thing that I've learned about him in the past day um, is that I think at heart he is an educator. Uh, prior to entering political life, he was chancellor at University of South Pacific. And I have never seen him so animated as when he is talking to <laughs> students and answering questions. And, um, and we've talked a lot about his vision for the future, and at the core of it is education. Education for people from his homeland to prepare them for the future, education of us. Um, and I look forward to being educated more today. So our plan for this session is that I would like to just show a clip of a trailer about some of the work that's done. This movie is on the film circuit now, and you can find it um, and watch the length of uh, the film in full. And then we're going to do a sort of a Q&A session that Mirage Desai will uh, sort of uh, will chair. Um, Mirage is also a fellow member in the Department of Psychiatry and the School of Public Health. He's a member of the faculty of the Climate Change Initiative. And although he will be too modest to say this, I will point out that he's just published a book on travel and movement in clinical psychology. He and I are often asked how psych <coughs> psychiatrists and psychologists are working on issues in this area. And that's, again, as I said at the beginning, um, because there is life outside the clinic and out life outside our office, and we would like to engage in it in the fullest. So thank you, Mirage, for helping with the questions. And let me just begin by showing this. Kiribati is in the center of the world. And so it's right there, bang in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So far away, so isolated, we thought it would be immune from the tribulations of this world. The issue of climate change remains the most pressing challenge for us in Kiribati. Rising sea levels have already taken a village on one of your islands. Do you see the possibility of all the people from Kiribati one day having to leave? For those of us on the front line, it really does not matter what is agreed to in Paris because we will continue to go under water. If it is a foregone conclusion, no matter what happens, what's the point of a deal then? Well, what's the point when we need to survive? What is going to happen to us is going to be the fate of the rest. We will follow. Thank you, Maya, for that introduction. 
In Kiribati, traditionally, before we interact with, with each other, we bless each other. So let me do that this morning. But before doing so, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, the people of this land and the elders, and to invite them to, to join us in this discussion as we engage, as we try to address one of the biggest challenges ever facing humanity. So let me bless you. But I also ask you to bless me back, please. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I would say is, come the Nauru, meaning may you be blessed. And you're, you would reply by saying, Nauru. Okay? So let me bless you. Come the Nauru. Thank you. If you didn't bless me back, then all my blessing would come back to me. <laughs> okay, the, t let me uh, take the opportunity to acknowledge the, uh, with deep gratitude those who have organized this and um, made me travel all the way from that center of the world to the other side of the world. But it's uh, something that I'm always very happy to do because it's a crusade which I've been on for quite some time taking a lot of my time, a lot of my energy, and maybe a lot of my soul as well. But I assure you, it's well worth it. Because we could never understand, underestimate what is at stake. I think quite often we get, uh, we, we get some very interesting observations by very interesting people who tend to underplay the gravity of what it is that is coming. And I think much of this is quite often people who just refuse to acknowledge, and I can, I can sympathize with that because at one time I was a denier because I couldn't face the reality of what was coming. Mm -hmm. I, I can assure you, there was a time when I, I came to the conclusion that we are in serious trouble. But I kept denying it, there must be, it cannot be true. But then there has to be a time when you have to come to terms with the reality. And you've got to begin to find your way out of that situation. And I can tell you that um, for a time when I started talking about this at the United Nations General Assembly, nobody had never been discussed at that level. But when I spoke, nobody listened to me because the focus one was on terrorism. It was about that time in the mid-2004. Uh, um, and so I got together with my people and I said, how can we get these people to understand that this is worse than terrorism? because it's going to be of such a massive uh, proportion. And so we thought, uh, what about, one of my staff said, what about eco-terrorism? OK, so let's incorporate that. So climate change is, like, is eco-terrorism. <laughs> Didn't make a change. Nobody was impressed. <laughs> but I kept at it. And then once I saw this article in the National Geographic about the, uh, the polar bears, I don't know if some of you might remember that, there was this focus about how oh, the poor polar bears would be losing their habitat due to the melting of the, 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 the ice in the, in the Arctic. And I saw it. I felt sorry about the polar bear. But I was looking for some reference to us because we would be equally threatened. Yes, yet there was never any mention of people. So I made this comment in the United Nations, and I think it sobered people up to, to, to realize that they were worried about polar bears, but, but not people who would be suffering an equal fate. But we're talking about a huge, huge number of people. And so for quite some time, really nobody listened. And then, of course, we came to the um, 2009 Copenhagen. Before that, there was a meeting in, in, uh, in, in New York at the UN just around the UN, the margins of the UN meeting. And uh, there was about two dozen leaders. I was there, the only one from, from, I think, the only one from a developing country, as I recall, but certainly the only one from the Pacific. And I recall the discussions, and there was, they were all talking about the impact of the, what was being discussed as possible remedies, how damaging it would be to their economies. And I was sitting there fuming. So I scribbled a note to the Secretary General. Can I have a word? I'd like to have, have a word. And I said, I'm hearing you, and I'm, I understand where you're coming from. But please also do understand where I'm coming from. I'm not talking about my economy. I'm talking about the survival of our people. So give that a thought. And uh, I remember President Obama had just come into office then. Now, always remember what he said. 
at that meeting I said, you know, I'd love to do something with uh, the United States on this, but the U.S. is such a huge beast. You cannot turn it around in one go. I didn't fully understand what he meant, but later I pondered over it, and I, I was expecting him to deliver in Copenhagen. He didn't, and I really was very disappointed. But then I reflected on that comment, and I understood. And I was waiting for his statement on his re-election, and he did make this statement. But I think the point that comes out in all of this is uh, we, we're turning climate change into a political football. And I assure you, it is not. You know? In our part of the world, we, we get changes of government in Australia, in New Zealand, and with it, a change of policy on climate change. You know, we had the, the Labour government in Australia, oh, we, we worked wonderfully. And then the other side came, with, ooh, and one of the prime ministers was saying, before he became prime minister, you know, the, 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 uh, climate change is, is, you know, in his own words, crap. Uh, and he offended me. And uh, so I met him in Bali. I said, you know, when I used to be in the opposition, I, I had loved the luxury of being able to say anything. But once I came into office, the real world is a little different. Hoping that he would change his policy. He did not. So that's how we've been doing this. And so I'll, I'll share with you some of the, the real experiences I've had. And uh, on one occasion, when we were uh, building up to the uh, Paris Agreement uh, negotiations, we in the Pacific, the small island, Pacific island countries, were trying to consolidate our position before that. And we were demanding 1.5. And then we went to the Pacific Islands Forum meeting. The, the Pacific Island Forum meeting in, in, includes all of most of the Pacific Island countries, plus Australia and New Zealand. And of course, when Australia and New Zealand came in, they started watering this down. And we, we did have a fight in the retreat. There were, nobody can see the fight with the leaders because there's only the leaders. Okay? So there's a lot of untold stories there. But uh, later on, during the press conference, there was these two leaders, and I was on the other side. I was the only one from the, the, the island country. And they were talking to a whole mess of uh, 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 media people. And they had, I was watching them, and they really had no, no problem saying that, uh, you know, two degrees, anything below two degrees in, in the rise in global temperature is, is too much for us. We, once that happens, our economies will suffer, and we would not be able to achieve the growth levels we need. And uh, I kept watching them. I said, of course, the media focuses on these people. They are more important. So I said, can I have a word? <laughs> and uh, of course, they, yes, I'm, I'm hearing these two. I hear them. I understand where they're coming from. But two degrees, even 1.5, even zero, according to the report, suggests that we will, our future is in serious jeopardy. And so we're talking about our future generation, and these two are talking about their economies. Make the comparison. And of course, the media got very excited. When there's a fight on between leaders, the media loved it, so I, all, all the hands went up. But it was all orchestrated. The one who was conducting, what's it? No, no question. <laughs> so, but I think that is what's up. And then I, I've said it, said, I don't. You can go two degrees, you can go 10 degrees, but as long as you can keep your emissions within your national borders, do that, and I assure you, you can go ahead. And so, this is the moral, because I've always regarded climate change as the greatest moral challenge facing humanity, because, why? Because when you're here sitting in the United States, and uh, if doing something, or getting something, or foregoing something means that you give somebody else a better chance at the other side of the world. The question will be, the challenge will be, will you do it or will you not do it? And I ask that question. And of course, we have leaders who say, no, it doesn't, it's not relevant to us. And we're getting that message right now coming here from your leaders, in Australia from their leaders, in, uh, I've got the list here. <laughs> Germany is about to start coal mining again. Norway is about to go drilling in the North Sea. 
Canada is now scooping up Tassin. The United Kingdom is going to restart the fracking. Australia has just started mining, opening the biggest coal mine in the world. And so, in Bonn, when you hear these people saying, we'll, we'll cut our emissions, and if, if, they, if it is true that Australia is cutting its emissions, but exporting huge amounts of coal, are we stupid not to know that they are actually lying to us? What is the heart of the, the issue? The heart of the issue is to re reduce emissions, not to look good. But we, we have to be stupid not to know that if they export coal, somebody else, they're giving somebody else the opportunity to, to what? To increase their emissions. I, I'm, I hope that I know Australians here. <laughs> <laughs> I go to Australia tomorrow with a, a tour to talk, and I'll be, they'll be shooting at me. But uh, I don't have a problem with that, because I think the truth has got to be told. You know, you've got to face these people. And uh, because the less you face them, the bolder they become. And I think we've learned our lesson. And our lesson has been that we've been sitting on the sidelines while all of this was ongoing, thinking that it's relevant to us, that we have no part in it, because we are small, we are inconsequential. But the reality is this, our future is at stake, and that is not inconsequential. And so I've been asked, what made you start talking about this? That very reason, because we always thought of ourselves as not having much of a, a part in the international discussions. And I think that has been our biggest, biggest mistake. So I started going crazy, and I started talking at the United Nations, very radically angry at first, Read my earlier statements, and you, you sense that anger, frustration. Later, I began to understand that nobody listens to a crazy radical, okay? <laughs> One who points fingers. Nobody likes to be pointed at. So don't point at them. Blame somebody else, but you are talk, directing your comments at them. But uh, I learned to repackage this, and I found that it was actually more effective. People would then come around and join you, you know, pretend to join you or whatever. And so I remained a radical. And so people asked me, so what, what, how, how would you describe your campaign? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm something like a rational radical, okay? Whatever that is, you're, you're smart intellectuals. You, you define a rational radical. But I think that's the way it's got to be. You've got to be from their part of the world in order to be heard, to be admitted. Okay? And uh, so that's the way I've been conducting my campaign. It's been fraught with disappointment. But I can tell you, there's been quite a significant change in momentum. I remember being in, in, um, in Brazil, Rio for the 2012 uh, conference. And I remember the, some of the leaders were talking, and my staff came running, and they said, hey, he's repeating your statements. And I said, good, it means they've been reading it. Now they want to take it over. That's exactly what I want. But I think there's been this buildup of momentum. Now everybody wants to do climate change. And even in my part of the world, this has been the case. Because at the time that I was talking, nobody else considered it relevant. Now I'm so happy as I've retired and my colleagues have taken up the ball and started running with it. Except for my own government. Where that film at the end of it that says, all of what I've been doing is now being unraveled by the present government. But that again is the example of politicization of climate change. Extremely stupid. Mm -hmm. because we have no room to play politics on this issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but they're beginning to... They went, I understand. As a new government, of course, they were in the opposition when I was in government. Maybe it's, it's payback to me. But it's not taking us anywhere. It's undermining the momentum of the campaign. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, what's, what's important is this. Nature does not care what you think. 
It's not clear what government is in place. There is a point at which seals say, oh, he didn't take the warnings I've been sending you. Too bad. Your time is over. And so it's important to understand that we may be on the front line. And uh, when we started putting uh, how uh, the front line, uh, I will explain to you because I, I do a lot of fishing. And I, I go on the boat and I see these coconut trees falling as the, 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 the land gets eroded. Yeah? So the, those are the trees on the front line. But I tell you, the erosion will carry on. And those that were not on the front line will become the front line. And they will fall next. Exactly what is happening. I think what's just happened the last couple of days are the signals. Mm -hmm. I, I was on, um, interviewed from Radio Australia. And I commented on the comments of the government, Australian government, in response to the current IPCC report, which, which they tried to underplay. It's, it's irrelevant. And uh, my comment is, is, you know, we cannot keep closing our ears to the fence. It doesn't change. And so I'm already being attacked on this. But I think the point that is so important is even though we're a few, several thousand miles away from Australia, we do not vote in Australia, and therefore are irrelevant to the political leaders of Australia. What, what happens next is, and I, I guarantee you, this coming summer, Australia is going to have huge bushfires. There are people who are going to lose their homes, maybe their lives as well. There are farmers who are going to lose their farms because of the prolonged drought. Now, that is relevant. But those of you who do, in Australia who do not believe climate change is relevant will, in some way, be affected. And I think that is the truth. I'm, there's no doubt you know this. I mean, in our part of the world, we thought we did not have cyclones because we create cyclones. And we send them down to our friends in Fiji, in Vanuatu, you know, there are presents because we're on the equator, okay? And so the storms go. But in 2014, one of the storms came back up north again, flooded all of the Tuvalu Islands, flooded all of the islands, okay? And, and did the same to our southern islands. The rest of the islands were flooded, but to a lesser extent, but it uh, damaged a lot of our food crops. I was talking to Matea, who has been to my home island. I said, did you visit that village? Because all of the breadfruit trees had died. Now, we derive, that is one of the most important sources of food for our people. And some of the, one village is gone. It used to be there when I was young. Other villages, they, um, what's happened is the uh, seawater has gone in, contaminated the first water pond, killed all of the crops, the taro and the surrounding trees, including birch fruit, coconut, and beginning to, con to contaminate the freshwater lands. Very soon, that community, not in a decade, but well within the decade, they will have to, to relocate. And there are several other communities in the same situation. Okay? And so these are the things that we are facing today. So because a bit of geography, let me know if I am talking too much because, yeah. you know, um, Kiribati, as you, know, you said, seen from the film, it's the very low lying islands. Uh, our mountains are about three meters, okay, above sea level. And we don't, have, um, we don't have rivers. The islands are very narrow strips of land. And so when there's a high, high tide, and we are, we're getting these now, there's always overtopping. You know, the, way, the, the, words, the, the waves are coming over and contaminating the, the, the waterlands. We wait for a little while, and then it would, the, the, the rainwater will flush it out again. But that's what we have to do. OK, so what happened? Uh, I was trying, uh, how, what do, do our people think? OK, I, I'm asked that a lot. I say, no, I try not to, to let them think, because 
if they think about it, if they understand it, acknowledge it and think about it, their lives would be so miserable as mine has always been. And so my strategy has been not to really drill it into their thinking that there's serious trouble ahead because there is nothing they can do about it. Okay? And there is no point in trying to make their lives even more miserable. But I think the burden is on the leadership to try and do something about it. And so what did I do? I'll tell you what I did at the first. I, I, my, if anybody, if any of the people had asked me, what are you planning to do because this is coming? And they, my honest answer would have been to say, I really don't know. And it's beyond our control. There's nothing we can do about it. And I agonized over this and I said, no, this is not good enough. If that's the way, if that's going to be my answer, I don't deserve to be sitting in this seat. I should go. And so, I, seriously, I didn't rest and didn't sleep for quite a number. And so I had to go crazy, find, come up with crazy ideas. And so I started talking about, um, I started uh, talking to the Japanese, and the Japanese came up with a floating island concept. You will see it in that room. But uh, they came up, I, I was in Tokyo, and they invited me, come on, this is, we've been listening to you, and this is what we, we think might be. One of the universities was in partner with uh, the, the biggest construction company in Japan, Shimizu. Okay? And they came up with this wonderful model. I think it was about $2 billion worth. Well, if we had to, we'll find the $2 billion. But at the moment, we don't have it. But those are the kind of things that we have to think about. And then I thought about um, raising the islands. It seemed easier. And uh, against all of this frustration, sense of futility, depression as well, I started uh, trying to put uh, people around. So I in, um, got our neighbors from the, the region the, we, who are in similar situation, Tuval, the Marshall Islands, and the Maldives. And I called, uh, I, I called the conference Climate-Induced Migration. It's interesting because it's precisely what you're doing here. And so, to talk about, you know, what are our options? And I put together a, a coalition of atoll nations on climate change. And the reason I did this was because we are in deep trouble. Well ahead of anybody else. And there is no way, I believe, I didn't believe that the international community could, will deliver. Even in, in Paris. And Paris just, still does not deliver. I remember when our, my people were going for the negotiations, I said, make sure there is a strong provision for adaptation because that is what we will need. Mitigation is what we are well beyond mitigating. This. It's about trying to survive. And it's about adaptation. What can the international community come up with? And of course, they came away empty-handed. Just a set of words. And we are still empty-handed. Because when I remember, somebody is asking me, one of the, the chairman of the UNFCCC said, what do you like to, what would your people like to go back, you to go back with. I tell you, Mr. President, they don't care whether it's 1.5 or 2 degrees, whether it's 450 or 350 parts per million. They, 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 all they need is some reassurance that they will survive this. And so far, there's been nothing. Until today, there's been nothing. And so what I did was literally give up because the international community is not ready to face this and will not deliver. So we had to go on our own. So I started talking to the, uh, as I said, the Japanese. I spoke to the United Arab Emirates because they built those islands. And they started, we started engaging. Unfortunately, I left office by the time they finished the report. I haven't seen the report. And the government won't let me see it. But uh, it, it does a very comprehensive evaluation of how we might raise the islands. It, it's part of the, the coalition initiative so that um, if it's done in Kiribati as a pilot project, then the other countries, if it works, they can replicate it. So that is still uh, under consideration. And yesterday I had the opportunity to interact with some people, faculties and uh, students, trying to provoke their thinking, trying to challenge them. And equally so, I'm asking you, if you have any ideas how we might survive this, please, don't be shy. And so our response, which I uh, drafted, was that uh, it would be a multi-pronged strategy. 
And it will be based on the idea, an acknowledgement that we could not, even if we try to raise the islands, we could not ever mobilize the resources to raise all of the islands. Nobody's going to do that. So we have to content ourselves with the possibility that maybe one or two islands in order that our people would survive. Okay, the rest would simply have to go down. Okay. So what happens? What happens then? It's going to be a totally different way of life. But what are the options? I also accepted the reality that some of our people, not all of our people, can be accommodated. And so we had to accept the reality that some may want to migrate. And it's, um, we should uh, provide them with the opportunities to do that. Not only provide them, but actually empower them. And then I came up with the idea, uh, I, I heard this eloquent lady talking about climate refugees. When I, every time I hear that, I cringe, because <laughs> I hate the terminology, all right? And the, and the climate uh, migration with dignity is precisely a rejection of the notion of climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Because being displaced is hardly a dignified endeavor. And I tried to put some dignity into it. And so it, it was self-boosting from my own uh, thinking. And so I needed that. And so I started talking about migration with dignity. And I believed it. I believe it. Because I think what's been happening is um, we've denied the, the, the reality that migration is part of our adaptation. Adaptation be beyond the borders. Because we run out of space that's high above the water. So where do we go? Okay? We have to adapt beyond our borders. And so having to straight our home will come and take over your home, okay? <laughs> I thought about it. I've been discussing with my uh, colleagues. Come on, let's go. You know, these people, they discovered Australia. Now let us go and rediscover Australia and take it over again. <laughs> <laughs> okay? But uh, I think that's the way it's going to be. We have to relocate. But if there is to be any re relocation, it is the obligation of the leaders to uh, prepare these people for relocation. And I, I think what happened in Europe with the mass migration from North Africa is the prime example of how migration was done without proper planning. And the reason is because we denied that it was happening. We denied that it was going to happen and therefore did not prepare for it. We hit our heads. But we know climate change is happening. We should train our people so that if and when they migrate, they go as skilled people, people who have a place. Okay? The first thing you, when you leave your home is to look for a place. Because in your home island, you have a place. But when you go to a place like New Zealand, you find a place. You've got to find yourself a place. And the place is here, and it's here. Mentally, you've got to find that place. The only way you can do that is have the sense of confidence to move in. Mm -hmm. And uh, be somebody, not a burden to the society that you go into, but be part of the leading, the leadership. To be able to contribute, to add value to where you're going. Close the gap between, that might create misunderstanding. Because you, people would be coming from different backgrounds. Okay? And the less misunderstanding, the greater the possibility of living in harmony. I spoke with some people from Germany. I was on a cruise and full of uh, elderly German people. And I, I admire the Germans for what they're doing. But even they are getting fed up. We're hearing what's happening in Sweden. Because, and that is natural. Because there is not that preparation. There is not that program for ensuring that the differences are minimized. So that not only people have less friction, but they can enjoy each, each other's company. Okay? Here in the United States, you're the biggest nation of migrants. You have your tensions, but yet, you are the most successful nation 
on this planet. Maybe not for long, I don't know. <laughs> but I think, and that is the notion of migration with dignity. And I am serious, I meet our people in different uh, where are communities in different. I said, come on, go, go to school. Educate yourself, become good, become as good as your people, become leaders in your community. And I look forward to some of you being going, going into parliament. I look forward to the day when one of you will become prime minister in this country. But don't quote me, I'm not trying to be president in this country. <laughs> yeah, it might, might be fun, I think. <laughs> but I think that's what uh, climate change means. It's a serious, serious challenge. And unfortunately, we're not taking it, with, we're not giving it the proper focus of attention. Okay. I, I have not gone into all of the detail because I believe we have questions and I think I've gone over 20 minutes and, uh, but I think we've got a, a question and answer. So I'll let you have that opportunity to um, maybe pursue some of the issues that, uh, uh, that uh, you want to follow and please don't worry about asking difficult questions. I love difficult questions because in parliament, they always ask the, the most difficult questions. It's deliberate. And they do it because they already know the answer. <laughs> and so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna ask me a difficult question, I know how to answer it. I just talk about something else. Thank you, let me stop. <laughs> Hello. So thank you, uh, President Tong. Um, I've had the pleasure and honor of getting to know uh, President Tong over the last three days, and I've found him to be a person of extraordinary grace, uh, courage, and humility, which is rare in our leaders these days. And it's really, uh, you cannot help but be a walk away affected by his presence. Um, also, what I've noticed is your strong moral vision, and you articulated a bit uh, yesterday. And so the first question is, um, what informs this moral vision of yours? What influences it? You know, I, uh, I'm trying to live by what I demand of people. And I say that um, if ever you have the capacity to do anything about anything, then you have the obligation because I believe God gave us different talents. You know, we're not all smart. Some of us are smart. You know, we're not all, all good fishermen. We're not, but if you're a good fisherman, you're obligated to share your catch when you come back. If you're a good what? Because God gave you the talent, but he also gave you the responsibility to share. And so I think in doing this, it's... Um, it, it was driven, as I said, by the fact that uh, the, we've been standing on the sidelines while our future is being determined in the boardrooms here in New York, maybe somewhere else in Tokyo, and that's not acceptable. I mean, I, I, I was brought up in a colonial era, and uh, I don't want the repetition of that. We want to be able to take charge of our future. So you mentioned the colonial era. Um and you spoke on this briefly yesterday, but what do you see as the relationship between climate change and the legacy of colonialism and countries who were formerly colonized? Well, I think we thought we were decolonized in 1979, but I assure you, the process continues. The process continues. And I argue, during my time in office until today, I continue to argue why, why we cannot Kiribati has one of the largest uh, fish resources in the world. Most, it's most likely that the tuna you eat comes from our part of the world. Because in the, in the central and western Pacific, we host 60% of the healthy remaining stocks of tuna. And so, yet, and it's billions, it's worth billions and billions of dollars. But we're not getting the millions. We only get less than 10% of the value on the side of the wharf, not when it 
gets into the retail shop. And so that is, that continues to be the form of colonization. We remain the source of material, the source of raw material, and we're not getting equity out of this. And so, but climate change, we are suffering, and we will be the first ones to go. And sometimes when I, in moments of deep despair, I said, okay, we're just the collateral damage. And once it happens, maybe the rest of the world will wake up and say, oh, it's true, they're gone. And uh, I'm sure for those, for those who have taken the trouble to, to think deeply into this, project their thinking into 50 years from here, they will think likewise, because that is the future we're heading into. Unless radical measures are, take, are put into place to address this. And on that issue of radical measures, um, this question is how do we address the disparity between wealthy countries' high, high adaptive capacity to vulnerable countries' need for such capacity? Okay, that's a, I, I think I've touched on that because we, it depends what your, I mean, you, you heard that our um, highest mountain is three meters. So we're more vulnerable than anybody else. And with the change in climate, and I see the most immediate danger as not the rise in sea level, but the, the, the change in the weather pattern. Once we begin to get the storms, our islands are going to go. During the storm that I spoke about, some islands in Tuvalu were not, are no longer there. They just got washed out. Okay? And so the question is, what is to be our future? Now, what are we going to do? And, uh, this is the question that I have never been able to come up with an answer for. So I guess then, do you feel our current global governance regime is aptly structured to handle some of these global challenges? You know, that we, we must not make the mistake of believing that national leaders will address global challenges. They don't. They think about the next election. Our, your leaders will think about the next election, not the next generation, because that's thinking globally. And climate change is a global phenomenon. But we got national leaders going in to negotiate, and this is it, negotiate. And we're not negotiating against each other. We're trying to find that, find the red line beyond which nature would not allow us to go. And I think we, we miss that. We think we're negotiating trade and access and what have you. That is not the case. And I think that is the biggest mistake we make. I've always argued that we need global leadership. We don't need prime ministers. We need global leaders to, to tackle climate change. So the theme of the global now will switch a bit to the local. Um, how has uh, the culture of Kiribati uh, informed your work and advocacy and activism? Well, we believe in uh, our culture of sharing. I mean, it's very rare. I don't think anybody in Kiribati lives alone. You know, I've got about two dozen people in my home. That's the way it is. And I, I remember I, I gave a talk, I think in Portland once, and I said, you know, in, in Kiribati we do this. You know, and maybe here in the United States, I see in the movies that this, I see this beautiful, huge apartment. And then one single person comes home, nobody else in the house, but maybe a cat. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so we need more of that. Okay, a sharing. Okay. And uh, is there anything uh, that gives you hope right now? What gives me hope is the fact that the, the, not to have hope is unacceptable. To give up is not acceptable. And so we have to keep looking and looking for some goodness in the hearts of those that have the capacity to influence the outcome. I know that um, sometimes you, uh, I, I listen to people and some people very, really frustrate me and I cannot understand. And I, sometimes I say, if, if you go to mass, don't bother. Don't bother going to church because there is no Christianity in you if you're doing things that you know 
with the knowledge that the information that we have today, if you know what, that what you're doing is damaging and killing people at that side of the world, why do you continue to do it and at the same time go to church? They are contradictions. So, interesting you mentioned the religion and spirituality. That's actually the next question. Um, yesterday, you had some beautiful descriptions of uh, the spirituality of Kiribati and how that relates to um, this issue. So what would you say is the role, overall role of religion or spirituality in, in relation to the issue of climate? And I think it has to do with what I always say, that uh, climate change is the greatest moral challenge facing humanity. And why? Because it's the test of our values as human beings. You know, do we value the next human being other than ourselves? Or is it all about me first? And I think we've got to get away from me first. Let's talk about us instead of me. And I think this is what I think we, we can, we can uh, share with the, the, the global community. That it's in, in our community, it's, it's never about you. It's about us. And uh, it can be frustrating sometimes. Okay? Especially if you're the one carrying most of the load and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's us. I say, but uh, spirituality is about the connection with the world, not things. Okay. There's a great deal more to this world than what a Tesla, okay? Mm -hmm. Than what, there, there, there's a big world out there when I, in acknowledging the presence of those we cannot see, because there is that world. And we've got to learn to connect with that, to understand that there is much more beyond the material, okay? And um, sometimes, You've got to think about the, 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 the larger picture. I mean, nature itself is a world on its own because we make the mistake of saying that nature is there to provide for us. Don't take God's word literally when he said, yeah, you are the Lord of all things. But what he didn't explain was that we're part of that nature. We kill nature and we kill ourselves. So we've got to learn to respect. Okay? And I know I understand that there, is, there are these conferences I go to and they talk about indigenous people. And so there are indigenous people and some of, maybe we are indigenous, some of you are not indigenous. Well, if you're not indigenous, you must be aliens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because everybody is indigenous. All we need to do is reconnect back to our being indigenous relating to nature, relating to each other. And I think this is something that perhaps we in our part of the world can teach the rest of the world. So we have questions coming up, but in the meantime, what would be your ideal solution then? I mean, this is a broad question, of course, but um, you can be as radical and creative as you've been speaking about the last few days. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me <clears throat> give you an example. When I was screaming to the world that the only way to deal with climate change is to make sacrifices, okay, and be very committed. And so when I was saying this, that's when I closed off the, what was then the largest marine protected area in the Phoenix Islands protected area. It's uh, more than 400,000 square kilometers of ocean. It's the prime fishing ground. Our fishing partners were very, very angry. Okay. But it's, it, I said, this is our gift to humanity, to humanity. The challenge was that, what is your gift? Okay. But I think the, the point is that we can all make a contribution okay. in everything we do. And I think the latest report is really painting a very, very dire scenario. We are, the world, the planet is in serious trouble. And so, it's going to be too late to try to respond if we don't respond, begin to respond today. We have to learn to give up a number of things. Okay? Maybe just do things differently. And I know, um, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to Australia, and I, I'll be attacking their coal policy because they, I don't like coal. Okay? Because uh, the IPCC is very clear, coal is the most polluting 
source of fuel. And uh, yet, why the Australian government is doing this? Because it believes it would lower the price of, of, uh, of energy. But they've not taken into consideration the other costs. Okay? And my information, I don't know, maybe some of you know that, is that renewable energy is now a lot cheaper than, than fuel, fossil fuel as a source of energy. So what makes us, what continues to lead us towards that path of destruction? Why do we continue to do that when we know that we can take this alternative path? So you tell, part of you, the way you speak is you tell very um, effective and poignant stories as well in the way, in the way, you, way you speak. So this question is, what stories have been most effective in persuading skeptical audiences around the world? Uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I used to talk about climate change at home in functions. And then the church leaders will come and say, virtually not looking at me, but saying, you know, what he's been saying is rubbish. God created this world, and God is the only one that can destroy it. Nobody else. And so I shake my head in frustration. And um, so that's why I went to see the Pope in 2014, I, go, I need to go and see the Pope because I need somebody on my side. Mm -hmm. and of course, the Pope, after that, we had a very long discussion. He came out with the, the, um, the encyclical, really reaffirming that, what it was that we discussed. And so I came back uh, smiling because their boss is telling them that I was right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the story that I tell, and I've told this several, several places, I don't know where the origin of the story came from. But it, it's very, very effective and it's very relevant. And this is, it relates to your uh, Hurricane Katrina, where this was, there was this lady who was highly religious, and the children said, no, let's, let's go. The floods are coming. And she said, no, I'm all right. I'm all right. God will, will look out. And so she stayed. They all were. They sent the boat back to collect her. And uh, she said, no, I'm all right. The next time, they sent a helicopter because she was on top of the roof. She still said, no, I'm all right. And of course, she died. And when she was going to heaven, she came marching in to the gate and said, where's this God? And, oh, he's sitting over there having some, some champagne. <laughs> and uh, marches up to God and said, hey, where were you? I was looking for you. Why didn't you deliver me? Oh, but lady, I did three times, but you turned me away three times. Okay? And this is very relevant in terms of the way we believe in, in God, because we want to blame God for everything, even delivering us. But I think that story is very relevant, and I think, I hope that it changed the views of our church leaders in my country. So it seems part of that is getting within, understanding their own frames of explaining this, but also challenging it. From yes. the inside, almost. I'll tell you another story. Okay? Here, it's relevant to you people in the United States. Okay? There's, the, there's two, these two neighbors. Okay? They live next door to each other. And this, this guy has got a tree, which is, makes turning around in his drive a little difficult. So he cut the tree. And the tree fell on his neighbor's house, destroyed it totally. So he ended up with his neighbor and said, Oh, poor you. Your house is... It's destroyed. What are you going to do about it? Okay, that is what's happening to us. But here in the United States, you know what your answer would be? Oh, I'll take you to court. <laughs> Can we take you to court? No. And that is what we are facing. Mm -hmm. We cannot remedy. We cannot seek justice for the injustice. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned some relations to the USA, so how can your experience um, inform some of the smaller displaced communities in the USA, for instance, or this was a question. Which, which displaced are they? So there, we're, there are displaced communities within the USA here as well. So how can your experience maybe inform uh, like countries like this that are experiencing internal types oh. of displacement? Well, we, 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 we're beginning to have that. We, we already have uh, uh, villages who have gone. You know, the, I, I, I keep, there's a village in the place where I used to go to school. And the village is gone, but the, the one church building remains. 
because they're going to dismantle it and it was being eroded. But I asked the villagers to build a seawall around it. So whenever the tide is in, there's this single church building, sitting out in the middle of the sea. And so I, this is what I showed the people. Okay? And so how do you deal with it? I think you, we've got to be responsible. We've got to be moral. I know I, I, I quite often make reference to the Titanic. You know, when the Titanic sank, and there was just a few lifeboats, but too many people. And so those that were in the water, and if they came up scrambling to try and save themselves, would you push them away or would you pull them aboard? And that is the question that those of you who have the capacity to do something about somebody else's problem will have to face. That is the moral challenge. And uh, any, if any, there are displaced communities, they will be looking for assistance. Do we have the moral capacity to step forward? So we have maybe five or so more questions possible. Five minutes, okay, so. Five minutes? Five minutes, which is probably. I'm happy to go longer if you're amenable. Okay. Um, so we have a few questions that have been uh, asking about your thoughts on the current um, negotiations and discussions with Fiji regarding cross-border planned relocations or re the plans with Fiji. Our plan? Yeah. Oh, i tell you what. I, I put Fiji in a difficult situation because I went ahead and bought land in Fiji. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I was criticized, heavily criticized for it. But it's part of the... Uh, it's part of the strategy to tell the world that it is serious, that we're not waiting for you. We're going to go ahead and make plans. But what, what I didn't do was tell the Fijians I bought land. And, uh, so when the media, people started asking me, did you buy land to move your people? I began to get worried because uh, the Fijians, you know, we, we're not invading Fiji. They're cannibals. They probably will eat our people. <laughs> and, uh, but that was the implication. And uh, it was actually debated in parliament. But to, to the credit of the Fijians, they, uh, the only question raised was the land, was the land that was purchased by the Kiribati government, was it native land or what? Uh, and uh, it was freehold. So there was no further question. But I think there is that underlying question. Are people coming in? But then to the credit of the Fiji government, later they came forward and stepped forward and said, Fiji, we'll welcome the people from Kiribati and Tuvalu, if ever they need a place to go due to the rising seas. And so that's been the first ever positive response or to all of the multiple challenges that I put forward to the international community. And so I took the trouble to say it in Paris to, to ensure that, oh, shame to all of you, because mm -hmm. you're not stepping forward. And uh, I think that is the kind of response we're looking forward. New Zealand, I think, is beginning to what, take tentative steps forward. I, I, will, I intend to visit New Zealand to try and take a full step forward to come forward. But they already do that. What they do is they uh, allocate a place of 75 per annum. And so these are the people who would otherwise not qualify for, through the normal channels. And so they're picked at random. But what we find is our people who go there, quite a number of them come back because they're not equipped to handle the needs for getting a job, living in. And so this is why I talk about preparing people because it's got to be a more structured uh, program. So it is possible, but it's, not, it's actually more than possible. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Given what's happening, those countries would either let the boat sink. And uh, I know the Australian position on this is very, very tough at the moment. But uh, that's why I suggest that we'll go and rediscover Australia. So I, I'm going to be selfish. And I have a particular um, fondness of islands. My wife, Usha, being from Mauritius, and her family, as we were describing, and close friends in Hawaii. And can you, you've been speaking about uh, over the last few days, your work with other islands, and um, how has that gone, or if you can give us a quick take on what that's been like in terms of the solidarity from islands. Okay, um, 
for some time, we in the islands regarded ourselves as being small, inconsequential, not a part of the discussion, the international discussions. And I think that was our mistake. And then we began, we realized that we're actually very huge ocean states. I mean, we've got 3.5 million square kilometers of ocean. And likewise, the other Pacific countries. So we started referring to ourselves as large ocean, ocean states. And uh, we began to take, as a, as a group, we began to take a more, a more direct participation in, in international affairs. And I'm glad to, sh to say that uh, pushing climate change to the, the top of the agenda, I think uh, the, the island countries were partly responsible for doing that. Uh, certainly, I kept bothering the, 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 uh, the then Secretary General. But what happened also was that, as a, as a block, we put the ocean in the UN agenda under the SDGs, okay, 2030. Uh, it, it had not been done before, so it is important. But uh, let me tell you a story about the Secretary General. When he, eventually I convinced him to visit Kiribati, and he did in 2011. So I sent him to go and look around. He came back in the evening, I said, so what, what's your, what did you find? He said, now I understand what you've been saying. Not only do I understand, I feel. So I promise you, I'll do everything in my part. And so, but what he never told anybody, and I keep, I follow him and I said, what he doesn't tell you was all the while he was in Kiribati, all his security people were walking around with a life jacket for him, just in case the waves come over. And the reason is because in Kiribati, when you're standing, you're always standing at eye level with the sea. So when the waves start coming in, if you're not used to it, you think they're gonna come over you. And so that is the extent of vulnerability, but we're used to it. And there's a couple questions related here about um, multilateralism. So we're in an era of uh, uh, a lot of um, criticisms of global cooperation. Um, and do you see climate change as potentially an issue that can revitalize multilateralism? I, I think it's... Uh it, it seemed to have done that in, in Paris, but I think if you notice the trend, now it's beginning to unravel. People are pulling back, and I did expect that because um, in, in Paris, I think the, 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 the French presidency really pushed the agenda and bang, the, the, what? the hammer before anybody could object. But I, I, I know that there were countries who were going to raise objections, but they didn't have that opportunity. So that is beginning to come now. And so the United States is talking about withdrawing. Brazil is talking about withdrawing. Australia is saying that, uh, pretending to be following the what, but actually in reality is sending emissions to China to burn coal. And so, and all of the other countries that are doing this. Now, that's not uh, leading us towards the path of, of saving this planet. We pretend because we look good. In, 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 um, in Copenhagen, I remember the, the statement by the Indian Minister for Environment, I remember. And I really wanted to get to this guy, because he was, um, and he, he, when he went back, he made a statement in Parliament to say, oh, I'm so happy that I sabotaged the, what? The, the, the Copenhagen process. And then I met this guy last year, and he started talking, and I, I didn't remember him, but he said, oh, I remember the president was there. Oh, so you were the guy that I really wanted to get to. But, I think having said that in, in, in Copenhagen, then I, I was in India to talk at the, the Delhi Institute, uh, which Dr. Pachari, the former chair, and I spoke there and I said, I'm gonna really hammer the Indian government. But what happened was the prime minister was there to open it, and he gave a totally different statement. He said, India will be a part of the process. And to me, in fact, what it, it messed me up because I couldn't read my speech because it became Irrelevant, because of what the Indian Prime Minister said. But, but I think there was that. But the, the question you've got to ask, is it a, a sincere desire to save the planet? Or is it to maintain good relations? Is it to, to serve other purposes? And it goes down to the fact, the point that I made earlier, that quite often we are thinking from a national perspective. None of us are seriously wanting to save this planet because we still don't believe that it's, it is in peril. So we have a few more questions up here, then we'll have one. one more. And there's, I'm gonna actually ask you 
Okay, so one, one here and then, okay. So, um, this is a very, so the, I'll have to give the last question up here to the student. Um, so, we're here at a university and um, I think a lot of students are interested in uh, career paths that you might recommend to become global leaders on this issue. It's an open field out there. And I think it's, a, it's an area that um, could never get enough people to, to advocate. And I, I actually, what I do is uh, recruit, recruit. And so those of you who want to be recruited, please come along. Because I assure you, what I've been doing is at every opportunity speak to people. But quite often I'm speaking to people who really believe. And I, I do welcome interacting with people who do not. And so once in a while I, I enjoy interacting with people who do that. But there are people who, who really genuinely want to know. And there are those that come from a totally different, with a totally different agenda. And it's, it's difficult to uh, interact with those people. But uh, I think each one of you is more than welcome. I, I plan to retire. I've been planning to retire <laughs> since I retired. <laughs> and uh, the more of you who come on board, the lighter the load I can, I can because I believe that it's not the leaders that we need to talk to. It's the voters. Because we need voters to tell their political leaders. Because now they think it's politically expedient to do away with climate change. Because it doesn't deliver the immediate benefits like reducing the, the costs of energy. Okay. But what we need is the young people especially to say, don't mess up our world, okay? If you do, you will lose the next election. This is powerful. And I think we need as many people to do that. So each one of you, if you can then recruit 100, imagine, mm -hmm. imagine what we would do to this world. Maybe we will have a hope in saving it. So thank you, and we have one more question. Hi. Um, my question is sort of similar to the one just asked, but I was just really struck by the first thing you said about um, there being a moral obligation to share the skills and the knowledge that you have. And, you know, me and all my friends, we have world-class educations. I go mm -hmm. to Wesleyan University. All these resources, um, and we all want to save the world, and our futures are just completely blank slates. Um, and I guess my question is, how do how do we keep in our sights that, that the, the wanting to use our skills to save the world without losing that in the rush of, of growing up and getting more focused and, and becoming like the world leaders now or, or the older generation? And I, yeah, how, how should we channel that into something actually useful that will, that will help people? Hmm. Let, let me share with you, the, because I was also a young one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still am as well, but uh, you know, we all go through this. And I, I assure you, because I went back to my old school a little time, uh, a few years back, and uh, I was talking to, to the students, and I said, I was there among you at one time. And I never imagined that I'd be sitting there. I never imagined that I'd be leading my country one day. But it's the path that is sometimes maybe predestined. And I think, be open to do that. Because I believe that one's life is meaningless until you can deliver something to somebody else other than yourself. And so with all the skills, the knowledge, the intellect that you possess, if that is entirely just for yourself, where is the joy in that? And so life is to be shared. Because the more you share it, the more you, the greater the value of your life becomes. And so I think the simple secret is look beyond yourself because everything else will reflect back to you. Thank you.